Maddie, what have you been up to since uh, our first week without basketball? Oh, you know, watch the Masters, of course, baseball, chopped off half of my hair, welcomed in a new head coach. I feel like it's been a solid start to prep for next year. I have a feeling I know the answer to this question, but what about you, David? Well, you know, I may have watched a lot of golf this weekend and uh, prepped everything else. You, know, Hey, Maddie, do you know what Scotty Scheffler and this show have in common? I, I, I don't know where you're going going with this, so I'm not even going to attempt. Well, we both are going to talk about the University of Texas. See what I can do there? See, I tied the <laughs> Masters in with the intro to the show. Hey, everybody, welcome to the Hoop Southbound show. Uh, today, we're going to get everybody caught up on what's happening around SEC basketball. And, of course, um, we're not going to talk about this on the show, but it was a wonderful Masters weekend. So let's get into it and let's talk some hoops. Hey guys, and welcome to the show. Full disclosure on today's show. Yes, we're going to be talking a lot of regular content and everything else. We're going to get into, get everyone caught up for what's happened and stuff since March Madness or what happened during the tournament uh, that we didn't cover on the uh, teams that weren't playing and everything else. Um, but it is the off season and we want to tell you guys about some of the stuff we're working on as well and see if we can catch your attention for any of the, our new viewers to some of the stuff to maybe like and subscribe in the future. So give us a reason, trying to give you a reason for to hang out with us this summer during the off season. So I'd say today's show is about 90, 95% substance and 5% selling ourselves to you on some of our summer content. Just want to be transparent with you guys because as an audience, you guys are important to us and we don't want to do wrong by you. All right. So Maddie, Obviously, we started this thing out a little bit with just some humor about the Masters and everything else. But you know what golf is really a sport about, right? I mean, drinking beer and cursing while you try not to throw your clubs. Yes, but it's also a sport about storylines. And that's uh, that's a big part of what we're going to be talking about today because we sat down this week and we came up with the uh, same thing we did last year. Three little words um, to recap kind of the season and where you're headed to if you're a team uh, going through. So we put together all 16 teams. Yes, 16 now, um, because next season when we come back around, uh, we will be talking about Texas and Oklahoma. So here we go. Might as well get started in our first offseason episode. So this is what we wrote down. Three little words from each of us about what we want to see this offseason or just what we kind of thought of each team's um, season overall this year. So let's start with Alabama um, for me, I wrote down my three little words for Alabama are stay the course. Um, this team has done an excellent job over the last couple of years of putting together talent and putting together good rosters and putting pressure and performing well in conference play. And it's it's been consistent throughout the years. So staying the course uh, this offseason is a big thing in my mind for Alabama. Uh, Maddie, what's your three little words for Alabama? So for my three little words, I'm more so teed it up as a reflection on this past year. So mine for Alabama is what a run. You know, we've talked about it time and time again, a historic run for this Alabama basketball team. And I only see it getting better from here. Yeah, I, I can understand that they got a good freshman class coming in, too, that we're going to talk a little bit about um, here in a little bit. All right. For Arkansas, um, you know, honestly, Arkansas got the coaches changing and everything else uh, that just happened with Eric Musselman going to USC and John Calipari leaving Kentucky. So I wrote down for my three, three little words for Arkansas is grow from change. Um, you can continue to grow this brand. You can continue to grow your NBA profile. Um, you're just going to have to grow as a team. But what I also want to see is John Calipari grow also this uh, coming into this season is I want to see him adapt with times and everything else and move forward, um, which we heard a little bit of in the press conference um, talking about roster construction. That's our biggest criticism for uh, for him at Kentucky the last couple of years. So for uh, my three little, little words for Arkansas is grow from change, both on, you know, for the Razorbacks and John Calipari as a coach continue to grow. And let's see where the hogs can go in the future. Yeah, for sure. So mine for this past season was what the <laughs> insert, whatever sound effect you would like to put there. Um, you know, we talked about it all season long. You, this Razorback team had ginormous expectations. It ended up being one of the worst teams in the conference. Um, 
you know, we've seen a lot of changes. So like you said, hopefully they can grow from this change and we can kind of have a turnaround um, from the expectations of this past season and, you know, just get the mouthwash, get the bad taste out of our mouth and, and move forward. Yeah, I would definitely like to see the move forward part after this year because, oh boy, it was indeed very rough. All right, for Auburn, my three little words, um, challenge your team. You know, I know Auburn fans are tired of hearing about it, the loss to Yale, but when you look at the non-conference schedule from earlier this season, um, back in December and November, Auburn didn't face that many teams that were in the NCAA tournament, um, whereas Alabama deeply challenged themselves, and you could see the difference. Once Auburn was put up against competition they were less familiar with, that was that tournament caliber, they got seriously challenged by Yale uh, in that game and ended up losing to them in the first round. So I would like to see Auburn challenge or challenge their team this upcoming season um, with a deeper non-conference schedule. And that way we can all get a better assessment for just how good of a team Auburn will be. So those are my three little words is challenge your team for this next year for Auburn. Maddie. March. What happened? <laughs> I mean, you know, we had, we like to poke fun at the Auburn fan base on our Twitter page. And that's kind of what I was going off of there. Um, because, you know, we saw them throughout the season talk about how they were going to win everything. They were the best team. Nobody could stop them. And then we get to the NCAA tournament. So hopefully, you know, they can work out some of those flaws this off season and, you know, much like Arkansas kind of move forward next year, get the bad taste out of their mouth. Cause it's, definitely going to be one of those things that people are going to bring up and say, can, can they overcome, you know, whatever deficit happened when they got to the tournament? Yeah, certainly. So, all right, for Florida, my three little words are uh, little things matter. Like the things that killed Florida this season uh, were free throw shooting and that and playing defense, you know, just these little things that they just needed to do a little bit better. And they could have been a much better team. It was, that was always the thing with Florida is that they, had issues where they had numbers that looked similar to Alabama and efficiency ratings and everything else, but like missing your free throws, um, playing a little bit better defense. Those are the things that I, I want to see moving forward for Florida and making sure in the transfer portal this off season, you grab players who embrace the mindset of doing the little things. So little things matter are my three words for the Gators. Maddie, what do you got? Well, you tried. Oh gosh. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, we saw Florida get much better from the previous season. Um, it was one of those, they were just kind of riddled with inconsistency. We saw one game where they'd have, you know, huge holes in both the offense and defensive side, go to the the next game, fix whatever hole that was, but leave a gap somewhere else. Um, so I think it was one of those probably growing pains for Coach Golden to try and figure out the best way to, to you know, build that team and be able to, cover all the holes and not have a, a basketball game that looked like Swiss cheese. Um, so hopefully moving forward, getting a little bit of experience under some of those players' belts, we'll see a much improved Florida team this next season. Well, I would say they've much improved this season as well, but I know what you're saying. And like I said, I think capitalizing on those little things will take Florida to that next level they're looking for because they had a really, really good second year uh, there, in the, there in Gainesville. All right, let's talk about Georgia. My three little words are make the tournament. Uh, look, you've found all this talent. You've got more talent coming in. The guy like Newell coming into your team. And then you got Blue Kane, Silas DeMurray, and uh, others on this team. And you had success this season. Uh, I think it's time that Georgia makes the tournament. They were kind of one of our like fringe teams uh, that we had coming into the preseason. Um, and here we are. They didn't make the tournament. But like I think going forward, that's got to be the goal for next year. Like uh, It's make the tournament time for Georgia and Mike White's tenure there. Too much talent's going into this Georgia team. It's time to make the tournament. So those are those are my three little words for the Bulldogs. So I promise I made all of these before the Masters started, um, but mine for Georgia is par for course. Um, just about kind of where we expected Georgia to be. Um, you know, there were times that, you know, I think they could have stepped it up and been a little bit higher, um, went above some of those expectations. But you know, we expected Georgia to improve, but we expected everybody else to improve as well. So it was just one of those things like, yes, they did great. I think they had a great second year for Mike White. Um, but like you said, you're going to have to continue to improve. Um, hopefully hit a couple under par, grab a few birdies in there next season. We'll take it as it goes. Yeah, certainly. All right. So let's talk about Kentucky. So for Kentucky, we all know that. 
it was a little underwhelming the reception of Pope um, or the the news about the hiring. Since then, Big Blue Nation has responded in kind, and they have been much more positively influenced and in everything else. Well, this is kind of both ways. Um, so when that when the honeymoon phase is over with in Kentucky, I just want to let everybody know that my three little words for Kentucky going forward right now when it comes to Mark Pope are very simple. Give them time. Give him time. Like Give Mark Pope the time he needs to build a good team. Don't let Kentucky expectations ruin what could be a very good coach. Like give them, give Mark Pope a little bit of time to do something. Uh, don't, don't lose your patience too quickly with this. Um, it's a difficult situation. It's starting to get later in the transfer um, portal cycle right now. So just make sure that next year you don't lose patience too fast because there could be some hope here. So don't, this could be a really optimistic and daring hire. So just give Pope some time. So my three words for Kentucky, give them time. All right, my three words for Kentucky this past season were double-digit curse. Oh, gosh. <laughs> We've seen it before. It was just one of those games, you know, you, you don't expect. Like, I, I'm pretty sure nobody had that on their bracket. If they did, hopefully they won a lot of money. Um, but I think with Kentucky, it's just, you know, getting a little more consistent. Um We've talked about the issue with the freshmen. We talked about it all season long. Um, but you you take a team that does great in conference play and just for some reason can't get over the hump to translate it into March. So that's definitely something that they have to look forward to with a new coach. You know, maybe you get new perspectives, new um, pivots on recruiting. So we'll see how it goes moving on under Pope. But um, definitely something that's, that's going to have to happen so that fan base sticks with them. Certainly. All right, let's talk about LSU. Um, my three words are build the momentum. Um, you know, like this season, you know, things turned around once Jalen Cook got on the roster for the Tigers and things really took off for them um, for the second year under McMahon. And so I would like to see LSU continue to build that momentum moving forward um, because there was a lot of promise this season. So I don't think they're too much further away from making an NCAA tournament find some pieces, make sure you replace some guys who are leaving. Um, but right now, like, I think there's a whole new level of optimism right now in Baton Rouge. So I say build the momentum. Maddie? Uh, mine's pretty much the same kind of concept you're going for. I wrote Promise for Tomorrow. You know, it was one of those seasons we weren't really sure what LSU was going to do. But as the season closed out, we saw a much improved team, a lot better from earlier on in the season. So they made strong strides, you know, to – try and get where they want to be. So I think, you know, if you get some players that stick around, grab some new, new recruits with talent, um, I think we're going to see a different LSU team than we did um, a year ago in this past season as well. That's fair. All right, for Ole Miss, I wrote get big wins. Um, you know, this team missed out on the tournament despite having a pretty solid record this year. And the biggest reason was is like the metrics weren't there. They didn't have enough Q1 wins. You know, this the resume points that Ole Miss really needed. So for me, I think you want to schedule a little bit tougher in your non-conference. Uh, just kind of the same note I had for Ole, for Auburn, but like get the big wins and get yourself into the tournament next year. Um, that way, if you have a rocky, rocky play throughout conference play, at least – You've got some games to fall back on that happened back in November and December. Matty? Uh, for me, I had solid first year. You know, we we knew Chris Beard coming in was a great hire for Ole Miss, um, you know, in terms of coaching-wise. Um, it, it was more of what is he going to be able to do with these pieces, especially early in the year um, when we had some. We didn't know if they were going to be eligible to play or not. So, you know, obviously that definitely helped Beard – getting Cisse um, and was it Cook? No, Cook was LSU. No, it was uh, Murray, Brandon Murray. Murray. Yeah, Murray. Um, Murray and Cisse getting those waivers approved and getting them on the team. Um, but a solid first year for Coach Beard. I think it's going to help definitely recruiting-wise as we go into this season um, and definitely have some of those pieces of talent stick around. I think we're going to see – another breakout year for this Ole Miss basketball program. Yeah, it would be, it's going to, it's setting up to be an exciting one for Ole Miss next season. All right. For Mississippi state, uh, my three words are the next step. You know, it's been a linear progression uh, under Chris Jans for Mississippi state. 
They make the tournament in year one. They get a better seed in year two, perform better in conference play, um, but they're yet to get that win. So take the next step. Is the next the next step is to continue to get better when you get into March Madness and get a win at this point. Like that's that's the next step. And it's been linear for um, Mississippi State, like I said, under Jan. So I'm excited to see if he can take continue that progression next season. Maddie, yeah, I had on mine season of improvement. Um, like you said, we saw them get a better seed in the tournament. We saw them get more confident in some of those rougher games. So I think, like you said, just continue to take the step up until they get where they want to be in the NCAA tournament. Absolutely. All right, Maddie, for Missouri, um, you've got the negative one. I already know what yours is. So if you want to go and lead, I'll talk the positive side. So go ahead and start with the bad, and then the I'll record go Record-breaking year. Record-breaking year is what you wrote. Okay. <laughs> Air to explain. I do I have to? I mean, yeah, we know what happened. Oh, and 19 in conference play. Yeah. Very disappointed, honestly, in Missouri. Um, I know the roster wasn't the greatest, but like, yeah, I'm with you. That was even below my expectations for what I had for Missouri. Um, for me, I wrote I wrote down win the portal. We know they have a great freshman class coming in. So supplement it. Uh, get those guys in who need to help. That would be my one thing I want to see for Missouri this offseason is through this portal, get guys that are going to help this freshman class take continue to be a really good team. Because you can go from an 0-19 team this season to a contender for next year if you do your roster construction right. So I would like to see the Tigers really win the portal um, to get themselves a chance. If you're if you're a Missouri fan, that, that's got to be goal number one. Just win the portal and you can set yourself up for next season. All right, Maddie, Oklahoma, where our first Big 12 team we're going to talk about here. Uh, my three little words, I wrote, finish the job. Uh, you know, we start saw Oklahoma start off great in non-conference play. They were in the top 12, um, you know, in week six and everything like that. They beat Arkansas and Tulsa. They were doing all these great things. They were winning basketball games. They get into Big 12 play and they play themselves out of the tournament. Finish the job is really my message for Oklahoma is like Porter Moser's got to get this team to take that next step, get them into the tournament solidly. When you're playing that great, like they were last year, they need to be in the NCAA tournament. When you're playing that well in November and December, you need to be playing good enough in January and February to punch your ticket in March. Maddie. You know what, David, this is scary. Um, I think we have started spending too much time together. Mm -hmm. because my three words for Oklahoma I've written down are first half victory mainly because okay. in the first half of the season we saw Oklahoma play great and then they just kind of collapsed um like you said played themselves out so you know it, it's one of these things like are they going to be able to to hold up in SEC play especially you know when you have you know kind of like Ole Miss where you where you stacked up all of these wins but did they really mean that much when you get into it? Um, yeah, looked great on the record. Um, but at the end of the year, it didn't really do anything to help. Um, so it'll be interesting to see kind of how they structure that schedule for next season and if they're able to hang around after uh, conference play starts. All right, let's talk South Carolina really fast. Um, mine's upgrade the roster. You know, we saw all this success that Lamont Paris had, but like all of their metrics were kind of outside of where you would like to see a team at. They they just weren't really metric starlings, but they got wins, and that's what gave South Carolina so much boost going into the NCAA tournament. The next step is to find players that are going to wow the computers. They're going to wow the metrics and everything like that, get that better seed, look really good on paper. So I think that starts right here in the portal. Upgrade this roster, find some guys who can continue the progression that we saw from year one to year two under Lamont Paris there in Columbia for South Carolina. Maddie. Mine was shocked the world. You know, it was one of those narratives we kind of talked about all season as they continued to win games. Um, definitely not something that everybody expected. They made it to the tournament. Um, so what I'm hoping for kind of going into the next season is to continue that progression because you don't what you don't want to do is have a phenomenal season and then just kind of drop off um, and take a step back. So like you said, Lamont Paris got a game plan, get ready for next season. Um, and I think He'll be able to do it and he'll be able to bring in good talent after, you know, the phenomenal season, kind of the the underdog of the world as he went into it. So 
Yeah, fair enough. All right. So, Maddie, Tennessee, um, my three words are find the guys. You know, we're already seeing a Waka uh, hit the transfer portal and uh, Jonas Adu's testing the NBA waters and, you know, Vescovy is graduating. You're not going to have Dalton Connect next year. So, really, you're keeping a portion of your roster for next season, but I think you need to find the guys who are going to lead this team for next year. Continue the trajectory that Tennessee has been on over the last couple of seasons where they've been or at the top of the SEC. So finding the guys and who's going to be stepping up to be at the top for this Tennessee team next year, that's going to be missing a lot of talent. You're going to have to find the guys if you're Rick Barnes to continue to do what Tennessee has been doing. So that's my three little words. Maddie? Uh, mine was Barnes makes history. Although they didn't get as far as they wanted to in the tournament, they didn't get as far as I wanted them to in the tournament. The narrative for years has been, can Rick Barnes do anything when it comes to March? Um, you know, when it's been questioned, and we even talked about how there was a possibility he could be on the hot seat if they didn't make it further along um, in the tournament. So I think this is a major step for Tennessee. It kind of proves they can get over that hump. So getting those players, like you said, is going to be huge. But I think the availability is – much more open for them to get what they need to continue um, kind of this progression. All right, let's talk. Oh, sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off. You're good. I thought you finished your thought. My bad. Um, (laughs) I'm trying to keep us on task. Um, (laughs) um, All right, let's talk about Texas Um, for mine for Texas is keeper cool. Now I I base this on my brothers are big Texas fans. Um, And like one of the things they're talking about constantly is how they don't like Terry. But uh, like what I talk about is that, Terry is done okay. Like, Terry wins the Elite Eight, um, you know, last year. And then, you know, this last season, they still make the tournament as a seventh seed, you know, in a tough conference. And didn't Texas also have some injury issues and some other things, too? Uh, so my my three little words for Texas is keep your cool if you're fans. Like, I, I think there's still some things to go, like, before you start just getting upset. Because, like, I think Texas is doing some right things. So keep your cool. That's my... That's my words for Texas. Maddie? So mine for Texas, uh, gearing more towards the future, is can they hang? Um, you know, just looking over their schedule, trying to familiarize myself as we we jump into um, SEC offseason talk with them. Um, you know, they had some fantastic games. They, they were a solid team. Um, but, you know, one of the first big losses of the year were against Tennessee. Um, so I think it'll be in, an interesting narrative to kind of follow. Is it going to be one of those teams that they come in from a, another conference and just kind of fall to pieces because they aren't used to this caliber of talent that they're playing against? Or are they going to come in and make waves in the SEC, make it, make a name for themselves? So I think it's going to be interesting to see um, kind of as we move forward uh, with two new bases popping up. How bad do you think the Big 12 is? I mean, I don't think it's terrible, but, you know, we did have the best conference for a while, but (laughs) we'll see. The Houston did just walk in there this year. I am going to say that also. All right. So Texas A&M, I've got 16 or bust. Look, like I, I know that we're talking about like. Texas A&M had a lot of potential for this season and they could have gone far. They finally get the tournament win that they were looking for um, that you kind of expected last year. But like, honestly, this team was good enough to make a sweet 16 last year. I- I'm surprised they didn't make it. Um, you know, preseason me surprised they didn't make it. Uh, regular season me was OK. This is not what we think it is. But 16 or bus has to be the goal next year. You need a second weekend if you're buzz. Um, so like to me, yeah, making the second weekend is exactly where the Aggies need to go because this team was better last year than or this previous year than what we've seen. They've returned a lot of talent. Texas A&M should have been a Sweet 16 team last year or this last tournament just based on where they were supposed to be. But they never got there. So it's 16 or bust for me. I really want to see Texas A&M take that next step. Maddie? Yeah, kind of along the same lines there. My three words are so much potential um, with a lot of dots afterwards because they are, they let me down. You know, I was riding hard for them at the beginning of the season and I, I, I don't know what happened. I don't know what to do with my hands. You know, um, like you said, there was so much talent, so much kind of going in from the previous season to be amped up about. Um, 
And like you said, it, it's kind of at a point where, you know, like we talked about the Rick Barnes narrative, I mentioned the, the double digit curse for Kentucky. And I think Buzz might be starting to kind of get a little bit of that narrative as well. Like you said, Sweet 16 or bust is, is I think, very much along the lines of what Texas A&M fans are thinking going into next season. Absolutely. All right, so Vanderbilt, uh, the last one we got to do here. My three words, recruit, retain, repeat. Um, there's a lot that's got to happen here for Vanderbilt, and I don't think the first year in Byington is necessarily going to be we're going to the NCAA tournament. I don't, I don't, get, I don't catch that vibe. Um, but I think with how tough of a job Vanderbilt is, if you give it a little bit of time, recruit, retain those players, repeat the process for a year or two, Vanderbilt should be back in the NCAA tournament and they should be back to having a good season. I, I have, a, I'm encouraged by the buying to hire. So those are my three little words, recruit, retain, repeat, uh, for, uh, for Vanderbilt. Maddie. They weren't last. <laughs> I mean, no, they weren't. They, they were <laughs> not last. Um, you know, I mean, that that was kind of it. We had them pinned as either last or second to last and pretty much every, everything we talked about leading up to the year and pretty much everything as we went through the year. But, hey, you know what? I'm trying to look at the bright side here. They got a new coach. You know, there's a fresh start, room for, room for growth for sure. Um, so, you know, really the expectation, like you said, isn't super high. So, you know, they can come out, be the, the South Carolina. I don't think that's going to happen, but they could be. Who knows? We'll see. Yeah, certainly. I, I understand what you're saying. Um, yeah, no. Um, <laughs> I think the optimism was a little too high in Nashville this season um, based on what that roster was turning out to be. All right. We all know what the biggest story this time of year is. Uh, the transfer portal is wide open and there are plenty of great players that are out there to add to your roster, um, depending on what you and your team need. So let's take a look at the portal. Here are the top 10 players available currently in the transfer portal. If you're watching on YouTube, uh, of course, Balo uh, coming out of Arizona was big, big news. Uh, and then Brandon Garrison, who plays that same position uh, at center, is also in the top 10. AJ Store out of Wisconsin, big player and great Osabor. Uh, also, just a ton of talented, talented players in the portal right now um, that you possibly can get. And Janelle Davis as well out of uh, Florida Atlantic. Um, Maddie, you know, we look at it and are there any players, you know, out there that are just really striking you that are in the portal right now? You know, we've seen a ton of movement in the SEC that kind of shocked me. Um, you know, you mentioned Jonas Adu testing the NBA waters, um, but also leaving his name in the portal. Um, and then Tobey Awaka, um, while he, he didn't get as much playing time as I assumed he would this season, I'm assuming possibly because of those reasons. Um, but you know, I didn't expect any, any of the Tennessee players that had remaining eligibility to end up staying just because, you know, they're on a great course. So those two really shocked me. Yeah. Oh, certainly I, I'm with you. And yeah, some of those names that are in the sec, I mean, like, let's talk about some of the players who have found new homes already. Like, you know, uh, Riley Kugel who at Florida is playing for Kansas next year. Uh, Tremont Marks is jumping over to Texas. That was news that came out uh, today. And then Michi Johnson's going back to Ohio State. Um, Lee Dort from Vanderbilt's going to Cal. And then Joseph Pinion and Rashad Marshall both jumping over to Arkansas State. Uh, both those kids from Arkansas. Joseph Pinion, of course, played for Arkansas. And then Rashad Marshall played for Ole Miss this last season. Both those kids headed toward um, going to Arkansas State, which has been a very up-and-coming program right now in the mm -hmm. Sun Belt. Um, for players that we do have coming in, like Houston Mallet from Pepperdine, great shooter coming to Alabama. Not a surprise, Nate Oates is going out there and finding a shooter for his guys. And then we've also got uh, coming in Cam Carter, who was playing for Kansas State, coming to LSU. And then we've got Kanye Clare coming into Mississippi State from Penn State. Jacob Cruz from UT Martin is jumping over to Mizzou. Um, you know, so there are players coming in here and there. And then Vanderbilt with their new coach has got Tyler Nickel and Jalen Carey jumping in. Uh, not surprised on Jalen Carey coming in from James Madison, considering that's where they got their new coach from. So follow coach as it normally goes is how it is. But there's a lot of movement happening and some of these rosters are starting to take a little bit of shape now. So we'll see how this goes over the next couple of weeks as we head closer and closer to decision day. Um, well, 
we still got a ways to go before we do get to decision day. I will say that and we're staying on top of all of it. But hey, when the dust settles, we're going to break down every SET team's transfer class um, for our new off series season, our series called The Portal. And that'll be coming out in July. All right, Maddie, let's talk about some basketball that's happening, you know, right now. So let's uh, let's start with the. SEC to the NBA portion of it. The NBA draft is not too far away, and that's kind of our primary focus right now uh, on this show, other than the transfer portal stuff. So with the draft coming up, we've got a couple of names that have already cleared for it. Uh, Rob Dillingham out of Kentucky, Trevin Brazil out of Arkansas, and Justin Edwards. They all confirmed that they're headed to the NBA draft from the SEC. Then Jonas Adu, we also know, made his uh, announcement that he's testing the NBA waters. So is Richard out of Florida. So there's a lot of players. There are currently 14 players on ESPN's best available list. Um, this is a weaker dress. Or there are 14 players from the SEC who are on ESPN's best available list. Uh, this is a weaker draft class, but the SEC is showing out strong in it. Uh, a lot of players uh, coming from Kentucky, like who didn't expect that? Um, but, you know, there's there's a lot of good names in here. Like you look at Rob Dillingham, uh, Reed Shepard sitting in the top 10, Dalton Connect also top 10. Uh, Trevin Brazil is looking like he could be a second round draft pick. DJ Wagner's also projected a second round draft pick. Um, and then we've got players like, you know, coming into this like, Janai Broom, we don't know what's happening there yet, but he's inside the top 100. Uh, Antonio Reeves, who had just came off a great season for Kentucky, inside the top 65. And Matthew Morell, it's been a long time since Ole Miss, I think, got a draft pick. Wouldn't it be interesting if he's uh, one that's taken here? Um, but, Matty, any names that surprise you or you get possible sleeper in the draft that you're thinking about? Um, so the, the surprise, probably not a sleeper, um, you know, I believe Devo Davis said that he was going to test the NBA waters again, kind of see where he lies. That one and Trevor Brazil both. I mean, we, we both know Arkansas had a down season, but a lot of their play didn't look to me like they were NBA ready. You know, so so assuming, you know, they may hit the transfer portal and get a little playing time somewhere else to kind of prepare them for that. Um was honestly a little bit of a disappointment because I, you know, I I talked about it with some people and said, you know, I can see them playing maybe in the G League or overseas. Um, but to me, it just seems like they're not ready. Um, so I, I guess we'll see as, you know, the combine comes out, see a couple of, um, you know, little like draft camp kind of things um, and kind of see where those NBA scouts heads are at. But those two were more of the shock of they're they're doing this. OK, they're doing this. <laughs> uh, one of those, um, you know, you mentioned the sleeper in the draft, probably some of those freshmen um, from Kentucky. A lot of times, you know, the one and dones are either huge names or they're just kind of in there. Um, Rob Dillingham obviously had a fantastic year. Justin Edwards. Had, not, surely. Yeah. Yeah. Justin Edwards had a little bit more time on the bench. Um, so I could see him kind of being a sleeper pick going a little bit higher than uh, some people were expecting. I'm, I'm interested to see what DJ Wagner does. Um, there's a lot of talk about him coming back to college next year. But I, if I'm DJ Wagner, I can pretty much guarantee myself a second round draft pick right now. Or I can face this really tough draft class that's supposed to come out next year so like i I'm, i'd be a little bit more tempted to go to the league now if a lot a lot of these guys that would be that would be a really thinking piece if i think i can get drafted i would be really considering it but I, i'm with you um surely we're going to get more names there's probably names coming out right now as we're talking and everything else that we're just not right on top of this second um but you're talking about Trevor Brazil. He's obviously definitely a potential draft pick, like someone who's being drafted off of potentials. But I do think it was interesting hearing what some of the NBA scouts were thinking about why Trevor Brazil's game looked so good a year ago and then compared to like this season. And one of the things scouts talked about was maybe Trevor Brazil wasn't that good. Maybe it had more to do with Anthony Black. Um, and that was some of the thought process there. I'll be interested to see how scouts react to Trevor Brazil throughout this combine yeah. and everything else, but he's sitting right now in a position where it looks like he could be a second round draft pick. All right. So let's look at, um, 
Well, we're going to actually, before we discuss what's going to be happening here in the NBA, because we're going to talk about that a little bit. Um, if you guys want to keep up with the NBA draft, um, it'll be here before you know it. We're going to be doing our annual scouting reports and putting all the notes together that scouts put together for the NBA draft on the SEC player. So make sure you check out the offseason series draft profile that'll be coming out next month in May. Maddie, let's talk about the NBA, though, because for those of us who still want to watch basketball until June, um, this week we start the NBA play in games uh, and the SEC, of course, is well represented, um, you know, here on the eaves of the playoff. You know, you got several teams that are in, you know, several players who are in there from the Miami Heat, uh, 76ers, Chicago Bulls, Atlanta Hawks from the Eastern Conference. Then in the Western Conference, you got the New Orleans Pelicans, uh, Los Angeles Lakers, a lot of SEC players on there, uh, Sacramento Kings and the Golden State Warriors. Maddie, who are you looking for the most to uh, maybe getting some minutes to play in this play-in tournament? Oh, in the play-in? Mm-hmm. I didn't think about that one. Um, you go and then I'll, I'll, I'll process. Okay. All right. So I am, of course, I'm interested to see if Mason Jones gets some minutes from the Sacramento Kings. Um, you know, that'll be big on me. Um, I'm, I'm anxious to see what he gets. And then also, you know, Colin Castleton got some late minutes for the Lakers, uh, the other night when they were playing golden state, I'll be interested to see if Colin Castleton's in there, uh, any at this time, but of course, you know, Anthony Davis is one of those names that we know we're going to see play. Uh, and then, you know, like Tyler hero for the heat. And then I'm excited to watch Ricky council, um, for the 76ers. So that'll be interesting, you know, as a Razorback fan, but some of these names that we saw get drafted last year, you know, like there's no, you know, some of them will make tournament, uh, or some will make the playoffs, but like Julian Phillips is sitting over there for the Chicago bulls. I wonder if we'll see any playing time for Julian Phillips, Maddie. Yeah, I mean, you you mentioned uh, Ricky Council, huge Ricky Council fan, so excited that they finally signed him and he's no longer a two-way player. So so that'll definitely be a good one. Um, kind of looking down the list. Um, yeah, I, I'd say Ricky Council is probably the one I'm most excited to watch. Um, pretty much everybody else I've kind of been paying attention to isn't exactly uh, – uh, on a play in caliber team. So I'll, I'll get to watch them as, as we move forward in the uh, playoffs. Well, also a big welcome to the SEC to Trey young and Mobamba uh, for those guys uh, now also joining the SEC, you know, names that we'll be keeping an eye on for the future. Um, <laughs> but yeah, there I'm excited. Basketball is still on um, and everything else, but that's the NBA. We'll be keeping a nice little touch on that for the players that are going to be coming yeah. out. And, yeah. I mean, OKC Thunder officially clinched. They're with, in the playoffs. Uh, like like an SCC factory. We're so, be talking about a lot of that uh, going through here about like who's going to end up in the NBA finals and everything else for like our players and things like that for the NBA. All right. Let's talk about what has been the biggest story of the week. Now, I moved this stuff down because. We've done videos on it already, but if you've been living under a rock, in case you didn't know, Kentucky and Arkansas and Vanderbilt were searching for new coaches, and all three of them now have new coaches. Maddie, people heard me talk about Mark Pope. Um, you know, when we when I put together our video for the reaction for the breaking news that Mark Ho Mark Pope had been hired for Kentucky. Now, obviously, it was lukewarm at first, um, the reception, but as time of course progressed. People are much more excited about the situation. And he nailed the press conference today. Kentucky fans feeling pretty good about it, but it was still a surprising hire. So for an outsider, you're still looking at this. There were still plenty of upset people in Big Blue Nation. I was listening to one on uh, ESPN Louisville the other day, um, their After Dark special that they were doing. And they were talking about like some of the Kentucky guys on there were just like, I don't know what Mitch Barnhart is thinking. Like, you know, just super upset about this. But like, I kind of talked about the potential behind this. And also I like Mark Pope, but Maddie, I want to hear your thoughts on Mark Pope because everybody got to hear me talk already. Yeah. So, I mean, Mark, Mark Pope has a huge shock. I feel like, you know, there were a bunch of names being thrown out. Um, and, and Mark Pope was the guy. Yeah. Like if he was, yeah. If he was on the list, he was those ones that you add is like a, uh, just in case somebody else does an RSVP to your party kind of, invitation um but you know it it got more and more heat i feel like much like the cal situation um where you heard it once or twice and then everybody started talking about it all of a sudden 
Um, you know, at first I was a little confused. I, you know, I kind of was under the same impression that a bunch of Kentucky fans, it seemed like we're under, like, why are there, there's so many, so many options. Why are we going for someone that seems like a lower caliber coach? Um, but, you know, like you said, as, as more and more got said about Mark Pope, um, you know, I, I saw some comparisons, not many, but I saw some comparisons to Cal, you know, they took a chance on him. He was at a smaller program and look what he built. So, you know, I think it's more of a coaching on potential hire um, rather than a right now, this is the best guy in the field. You're expecting, you know, him to grow as well as the program to continue to grow. So I, I think it is a good hire. Um, but I think, like you said earlier, it's probably going to take a year or two to get back to kind of those expectations that Kentucky has for their program. Yeah, and there's an influx of NIL money coming in with this. Um, not as much as like Cal got with Arkansas, which was kind of surprising. Um, but overall, like, yeah, this is very surprising. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm I like Mark Pope. I, I will say it again. I like Mark Pope. Um, what he did at BYU is really darn good. And that was an exciting brand of basketball to watch. And, you know, it was good times out there in Provo. Um, and he's a Kentucky guy. Like, you got to love the fact you get an alumni coach coming back in. Now, the thing is, he has yet to win an NCAA tournament game. And he has zero conference titles. That's where we're going to get concerned. Like th the resume just does not speak to what Kentucky fans were getting upset about with Cal. Um, instead, it's more here we are, you know, like they're, we're going to hire this guy on his potential, even though there's no body of work yet that says that this is going to happen. But winning a tournament game is hard and everything else. And I, I know he has not been a coach, uh, you know, as long as someone, you know, like John Cal Perry, Eric Mussman, like go down the list, Dan Hurley, Billy Donovan, whatever, whoever you want to go and talk about. Um, but like overall, like Mark Pope's got a ton of potential, certainly does. And he just got done playing in a tough conference uh, with a program that has a lot more recruiting restriction restrictions on it than other programs. So, you know, it, it's almost like, high, you know, coaching at a private institution is hard, especially a private institution that is very committed religiously um, to their faith. So, like, overall, yeah, this was the, you know, Mark Pope's had some barriers for him. And he's only coached at small programs, but he's a Kentucky guy. He nailed the press conference today. Love his offense. There's a ton of ceiling here. There's plenty of concern, but there's a ton that, you know, you, you, we'll see how high this goes because there's a, there's a lot of things to be optimistic about in his approach to basketball. So very curious how this is going to go down uh, here in the future. Um, and of course, for those of you who didn't get caught up on the news, that was also the big news that we talked about a little bit last week. John Calipari now coaching in Arkansas. Just wanted to throw this out there is that Nolan Richardson chimed in on this. And, uh, you know, of course, we heard Cal talk in the press conference about this and everything else. But Nolan Richardson uh, in a report, forgot where I came across this. I'm going to look it up again for everybody and put it in the uh, link. He said, uh, if there if I were a betting guy, I would bet on I would bet on him talking about John Calipari eventually winning a national championship and it won't take long just a lot of praise for nolan richardson and just a lot of a lot of praise from nolan richardson about john calipari and i think one of the funniest things that we've seen out of this coaching search between arkansas and kentucky and everything else is that these two have really re-embraced the 90s like heat that was between kentucky and arkansas we had arkansas come from the southwest conference and dominate the sec like its first two years or so and then kentucky take taking everything back and there was a lot of like passion and building of a rivalry there uh what really cracked me up though is that ks ksr the uh kentucky radio station uh there or sports radio in uh, lexington they received a care package from tyson foods um with dino nuggies and everything included uh but yeah that was that was crazy i saw that oh, on fantastic. yeah Perfect, perfect trolling right there. Everybody got a pretty good laugh out of that. Um, but I'm excited because this is this is really interesting. This is one of the things that we've talked about um, is 
just a reinsurgence of this rivalry and a rebirth of it because like it's been needed. It was getting better with Eric Musselman at the, at the helm for Arkansas, but there's been great games between Arkansas and Kentucky. I would say Arkansas, you know, as a rival to Kentucky is like that 18th team, but like in conference, they're probably like the second, like the second or third team in conference um, as a rival. But, you know, grand scheme of things, Kentucky cares about a lot of their teams a lot more, but in conference, it's definitely great when these two teams have, a lot of success and if you can rekindle that 90s spirit arkansas and kentucky when they were at their height was just great great basketball to watch we we both went to the the press conference on wednesday um amazing atmosphere you know i think a lot of arkansas fans are are really excited about this hire definitely one that you know comes with its own concerns we we've talked about last season um you know, kind of the hump that Kentucky can't seem to get over in the NCAA tournament um, while coming off of the the Eric Musselman era where we don't really care as much about SEC and conference play, but what matters is March. So I think it's going to have to be kind of a mindset shift. And, you know, we we heard the Cal press conference and um, the, the talk about how recruiting is going to have to kind of change and be a little bit more strategized as instead of bringing in all the, the one and dones. Um, so definitely something to look at moving forward, but I think, you know, the reception was warmer than expected, especially for coach Cal. Um, you know, I made the joke that that's probably the only time anybody's ever cheered for him coming into Bud Walton arena. So I I think it's going to be a great season. And I think, you know, Arkansas fans are definitely happy and those Arkansas Kentucky games are going to get even more interesting. They they're certainly going to get interesting. And let's talk about Nashville because this was some news that came out during the tournament. Uh, of course, um, Mark Byington was the head coach at James Madison and uh, took the uh, took the Dukes to the second round of the NCAA tournament to face Duke. Um, but they ended up hiring Vanderbilt, hiring Mark Byington as their new head coach. He's got a pretty good resume. Uh, it's not bad for a young coach. Um, over two hundred wins. Got some NCAA tournament wins, um, conference championships. He's got some experience both as an assistant coach at the Power Six level and then also as a head coach at various universities around this region. Uh, Georgia Southern, Charleston, he was an interim coach there. And then, of course, James Madison is where we've seen just huge success for him. Um, but, yeah, he's also been an assistant coach at Virginia Tech and Virginia and Charleston. So he he's an interesting coach. Um like his offense a lot. It's very offensive minded where it's going to be a lot of tempo. And he also likes the defense to create the offense a lot in a lot of ways too. So it's an exciting hire for Vanderbilt. I think they got a solid one to start building back. And as we were talking about with Joey Dwyer, um, back when we were talking about when Jack, Jerry Stackhouse got fired, Byington someone that has that mid major mindset to build. So this could be a really good hire for Vanderbilt and their future. Um, and speaking of future, we all know where it's coming up here pretty quick is that we're going to start seeing a whole new crop of freshmen coming in to the SEC. Maddie, let's start with Kentucky. Um, we've seen some craziness start to happen with Kentucky's Ross or freshman class. Now, this was the number two ranked class in the country, according to 24 um, seven. And then, of course, things have changed. Carter Knox. uh reopened his recruitment. Jaden Quinnitz, uh, he reopened or he requested out of his NLI and same with uh, Santo Cyrell. So does Boogie Flynn, Billy Richmond and Travis Perry remain on the Kentucky uh, incoming freshman class at this point? We'll see what happens uh, with Kentucky. All right, let's talk about what the situation with Mizzou. Now, there was a big shakeup in the 24-7 rankings. I don't know if Mizzou fans are aware of this. It didn't really have a massive impact, but we saw a lot of players drop down a star or drop down in the rankings or go up like a Norboding. But Mizzou ends up with the number five class uh, coming into this year. Uh, Norboding, of course, front lines it with Peyton Marshall uh, and then T.O. Barrett's three-star um, and Trent Burns and Marcus Allen, both four stars as well. Um, Maddie, I'm going to say it again. Like this can be a very good class for Mizzou. This could be a lot of things. So I, it's really important. They win the transfer portal to see if they're going to end up kind of like Georgia this season, or if they're going to find a lot of success this season and be a top level team, because they got the talent they're looking for. Uh, it's a matter of, can they get the experience they're looking for to get some wins as well? Um, that's going to be a tough one. And then like, let's look at, 
Alabama. They got the number seven class in the country coming in. Darian Reed, Aiden Sherrill, and Nas Cunningham. Uh, they're out there trying to add more tide to this situation and see if they can't get Alabama back to a Final Four. And then another top 10 recruiting class is coming into the SEC. Uh, the new kids in town, Texas, got the number 10 class in the country. Trey Johnson, Cam Scott, Nicholas Cody, those guys all coming in to Austin this season. So Texas with a really darn good class as well for next season. A lot of talent coming to the SEC next year. And there's going to be, with all that talent, you're going to want to know a little bit. So we're going to go through the tape, break all down the top what the top scouts have to say about these freshmen. We're going to go through the top 15 freshmen coming into the SEC next season. We'll see what happens with this Kentucky class. I had things sorted out, but like depending on what happens with that class, we'll see if we have different players than what we were talking about just like a week ago about who's going to be in. But that series will be coming out in August as we get closer to the uh, to the season. Hey guys, thank you so much for checking out this week's show. We're glad you're here. We love college basketball. And if you're listening to a college basketball podcast after March Madness, I'm guessing you love college basketball too. So we've got a ton of reasons. I hope that you heard a few to stick around for this offseason. So if we've earned that and you're interested in any of the series that we're going to be having coming out this offseason, please like and subscribe to the channel or follow us anywhere that you guys get your podcast. And we'll catch you guys next week. Thanks, guys. Have a great week.